praise the Lord, saints. How you doing? Well, I know everybody's blessed and everybody's ready for the Word of God. Well, I'm just going to give you a little bit tonight, and then next week we'll go into in-depth on this teaching. Uh, we do welcome those of you that have come through by live stream. Um, we thank God for your presence tonight. We ask God to bless you, bless your home, your family. And we pray that the word of God will enlighten you, encourage you, strengthen you, and transform you on this night. Uh, before I start, I want to once again uh, welcome you to our conference. We have our conference every year. Uh, this year will be July the 29th and the 30th at 7.30 p.m. of this month. And then Sunday we'll close it out August the 1st. Saturday we'll just take a break. And we, um, our topic is going to be transi uh, transition, transition of the church. Uh, God is transitioning and moving us as a church uh, in this world to uh, a place that we've never been before, but it's a good place. And so I want to share those three topics on those three nights, moving from believing to knowing, from the word to the will, and from change to transformation. And so each one of those nights, I deal with one of those uh, subjects. Um, it's important that you get the teachings if you're not here, but we welcome you to be present uh, with us on those nights. God bless you. Look, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, partakers in Christ. Partakers in Christ. Now, I know last week we dealt with salvation and works, but I've got to move by the Spirit. Amen. Uh, but we're dealing with partakers in Christ. What does it mean to be a partaker? Throughout the Bible, you'll find, especially in the New Testament, after Jesus Christ died and after he resurrected from the grave, you'll see the word partakers. And so if you look at that word partaker, you'll think it just means taking something, you know, taking your part, as people would say. But I want to give you the meaning of what it is to be a partaker so when we look at the scriptures, you know what God is actually saying to us. Only the Christian, only the believer can partake in Christ. Only the believer. The unbeliever has no part in this that we'll talk about tonight. So as a believer, you are honored, honored and privileged saint to be able to partake of the seven things that we're going to share throughout this teaching. I will say this, the communion table of the Lord, it really, really gives us um, the meaning of what it is to partake in Christ. So at the end, I'll deal with the communion table. But for tonight, we're just going to share what it means to be a partaker. To be a partaker means you're going to share. You're going to share. You know, something has been given to you as the body of Christ, and you're the, not the only person it's been given to, but there are many members in Christ that also share a part of what you also uh, are, are going to partake of. Jesus Christ, God our Father, has given us all something to share from out of Jesus the word also not only means to share, but it also means to partner. As partakers in Christ, we are partnering with him. Not just me alone, but all the members of the body are partners with Christ. Not only are we partners, but we're companions. We're a companion of Christ, and we also are companion with one another. It also, if you look at a uh, further definition also, it's a real broad term. It means to participate. As a partaker, God is asking us to participate in something. And the last word that I'll use, when you see the word fellowship in the Bible, it really has a lot to do with partaking. You cannot be a partaker without fellowshipping because even fellowship means that you are associated with someone, you're sharing something, you're participating in something together. 
So when you see the word partake, that's what I want you to have in mind. Let's go right to it and find out what is it that we are partakers of. Turn to Hebrews 3 and 4. Hebrews 3 and 4. Excuse me, excuse me, Hebrews 3.14. Yeah. When you get this, say praise the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews 3.14, for we, talking about the body of Christ, are made partakers. We are made partakers by God. Whether you want to be a partaker or not, you are made a partaker. You are made one that will share with Christ what he has. You'll partner with him in what he does. You're a companion. You're going to be in relationship with him. You're going to be in the same fellowship with him and God. You're going to participate in whatever he's doing. This is what it is to part uh, partner um, to partake. We are made partakers of who? Christ. Christ. Circle that, partakers of Christ. So what does that mean? That means we share Christ together. Christ means the anointed one. So we have part with Jesus Christ as the anointed one. What does it mean? How do we partake of Christ as the anointed one? When you go to Hebrews, the third chapter, the first verse, let's turn over there, we'll get some idea of what God is saying through the writer here. The Bible says, and read with me, wherefore, holy brothering, partakers of what? The heavenly calling Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. What are we partaking of that God made us partakers of? Of the heavenly calling that Christ has. In other words, Christ has a calling that came from God. Every believer that is in Christ can share of that call. You can participate with him in that call. You are a companion, and you fellowship with him in that call. What is the call that Christ has? Just breaking it down to you, Christ is called the Son of God. We share in his sonship. So what God wants you to do is partake of his sonship partake of his sonship. Now, as a son, Jesus Christ is both king and priest. Am I talking to you? God has made you a son to share with Christ Jesus in who it is for him to be as a son. Matter of fact, read Romans 8, verse 28 and 29, it says, whom God called, we know he foreknew them, he called us to be conformed into the image of his son. God called us according to his purpose, and a part of God's purpose was for us to be like Christ Jesus, to be a son just like him. I mean, you know Jesus didn't have to become a son. Jesus already was God. Jesus came down to become a son so you could be a son in him. Do you understand? Jesus Christ, the Bible says in St. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? Jesus, before he became flesh and became a son, he was just God. Okay? So why did he leave come down as God, why did he come down to be a son? Because we were in sin, God had to redeem us, and so God made us sons, and he wants us to partake of sonship. Am I talking to you? In other words, as long as you're in this planet, 
Thank God for your mama. Thank God for your daddy. And you can thank God, even though you didn't have a daddy or mama, God has made your son so you can have God as a father who is from heaven, which is the greatest honor to have. If you have God as your father, you have everything you need in this earth. You have everything you need because God, as a father's desire, is to give you the kingdom. Am I talking to you? God's desire as a father is to meet all your needs, earthly and spiritual. So what your earthly father and mother cannot do, God wants to do it for you. It means something for you to be a son of God. It's just not a title, it's just not a position. For you to be a son of God, that means God is responsible for you. God treasures you as someone very special. Nobody else outside of God's sons is a son of God like you are. God can take care of the whole earth realm. He can father the whole earth realm. But only you are born as sons of God. You have an awesome privilege. So Romans 8, verse 28 through 29, said God purposed for you to be a son before you was born into this world. He called you to be his sons, those that receive Jesus. We also find out in 1 Peter 2 and 9, that because Jesus is a priest, you also are a royal priesthood. Now, am I talking to you? Turn over to 1 Peter 2 and 9. First Peter 2 and 9. Then you get to say praise the Lord. The Bible says here, speaking through Peter, the writer, he says, but ye are what? A chosen generation. And then what he call you? A royal priesthood. You know, my pastor used to say many times, when you see the ye or whosoever, he always say, put your name there. <laughs> that way you can read it as, but Frank Dawson is a chosen generation. And Frank Dawson is a royal priest. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews, that third chapter, that Jesus is a high priest. And then it says after the order of Melchizedek later on in the scripture, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, but he was king priest. So Jesus is a king priest. And guess what you are? In Christ, you also are king priest. And what God wants you to do is he wants you to identify with that. This is why when we come into the sanctuary, you go home, and you, 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 you're just not a, a normal human being. There's nobody on this planet that is a king priest. Very seldom in this world will you find anywhere where men are kings and priests. You may find a king rally in the, the, the United States. Um, well, you find in the United States. In this world, you might find a king. Like you might go over to Saudi Arabia and you may find kings. See, you go in the Middle East, you may find kings. But you no longer see kings anymore. You see uh, presidents and you see people here of parliaments and you see all kinds of people, but you don't see kings. That is something, ain't it? So it's very hard for us to identify being a king with that looking at a king other than Jesus. You have awesome power. Awesome power in this world. So we are to partake of Christ. That means partake of his sonship, partake of his kingship, and partake of his priesthood. Matter of fact, Revelations 1 and 6 says, whom God redeemed us and has made us kings and priests. God made you that. Not gonna, you're not going to be that when Jesus comes. You are that now. Turn over to Revelations 1.6. 
Yeah, I'm not looking to become a king. I'm not looking to become a priest. I am that now. This is why I say it don't make no difference what your occupation is. In this world, people may put you down, or you may feel like you didn't reach the place that you want to reach, or you may be in a high position with a lot of responsibility, and people think you're somebody great. But let me tell you something. There is nobody in a higher position than the children of God. You always hear me say this, God have kings and priests who are dishwashers in this world. God have kings and priests who are health care workers. God have kings and priests who are lawyers. God have kings and priests who are apostles. You are a king and a priest no matter what your profession is naturally. Am I talking to anybody? So when you read the scripture, and the scripture tells you about binding and loosening, when the scripture lets you know about the word of faith that we're teaching about if you say anything, you know, and not doubt in your heart, those are king's words that can move mountains because you're, you're, you don't have an earthly calling, you have a heavenly calling. So what that means is earth must answer to you because heaven is above the earth. Yeah, 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 so. So to be a partaker, to be one that's sharing what Jesus has and know that you are not the only person that's a king priest, your brothers and sisters are kings and priests. Now we have to ask ourselves the question because when I get into the conference, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna say some things that's just about unbelievable. But how many know I want to move you up a little bit more in your thinking? The Bible says man's thoughts are not God's thoughts. His ways ain't God's ways. As far as the heavens is to the earth, so is God's thoughts above man's. Am I talking to you? So when I get in the conference, I'm not going to be talking no little stuff. Amen. When I talk about moving from believing to knowing, that's the way God is carrying you. Remember what I said the other day? You can believe a lot of things that can be shaken. You can be shaped in what you believe, but it's hard to shake you in what you know. Am I talking to you? Oh, it's going to be really good. Ha! <laughs> Praise God. Especially when I get to change, transition from change to transformation. I asked the Lord this week, I said, Lord, can I really, really teach on that one? Can the people take it? Because that is a powerful one. But I'm going to be talking to you as sons and not just the sons of your mother and your daddy. So yes, so we're partakers of Christ. So sometimes you have to ask yourself if, you know, in, in the natural, a king cannot rule in the same territory of another king. You can't have two kings in the territory. It's not needful. So when you, when you look at being a king and a priest, can I expand your mind a little bit beyond here? What are you going to be ruling over? It sure won't be the earth. Heaven will be on the earth. The new Jerusalem will be on the earth. God will be the light of this city, and God will have total control over the earth. What are you going to be ruling over? This is why we must understand dominion and kingdom. Kingdom is far broader than the earth it's far broader than the natural arena kingdom is in the invisible operating as well as the visible and kingdom if you break the word down is king's dominion so God wants us to share and all of Christ's dominion, both visible and invisible. That's what he's given you. Now, a lot of things you don't know right now, and I don't know right now, but it has to be revealed by the Spirit, and it is written in the Word of God. It's just that we have to understand there's more to learn than just your academic knowledge in this world. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yes, so Christ, the anointed one, the anointed one is king. That's what he is. He's anointed to be the king. And matter of fact, he's the king of heaven and earth. 
He's king of the visible realm and the invisible realm. He's king of it all. That's why the devil is no match to Jesus. The devil only is a prince of this world. Cosmos, fallen state. The, the, the world that Adam sinned, and when Adam sinned, Satan took over rebellious dominion because now whoever you obey to sin, his servant you are. Man became a servant of sin because of what? The fall. Satan was the first one to sin. Did you know that? So Satan has lordship over all sinners that not under Christ. He has the rule over them. Why? He's the first. He has the preeminence. First of anything means you have the preeminence. That's why Jesus had to be the firstborn. Colossians said he has the preeminence over everything. He, Jesus is not a prince. He's a king. Satan is a prince. Satan is the prince of the power of what? The air. Jesus is the king and lord of heaven, <laughs> which is lord over the air, atmosphere, as well as the heavens, the invisible realm. Yes. Now, you share in that dominion. You share in Jesus' authority. You participate in whatever he does in the earth realm and in the heaven realm. You know, a lot of Christians only think about what Christ is doing in the earth realm. But once you come above the earth, you're in the atmosphere. And once you become above the earth, you also are able to have power in the invisible realm. That's why God says that you have power to bind and loose in heaven, what's in heaven and in earth. Yeah. 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 That's why most Christians are only dealing with natural problems. And I'm going to tell you this, your natural problems is not the root of your problems. Your natural problems have spiritual there's a spiritual force behind your natural. And a lot of times what Christians need to do is go behind and beyond the natural and deal with the unseen realm. That's the way the havoc is taking place in your home, your church, your job. When you can fight that battle, as Ephesians 6 chapter says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil tries to take the mind of the Christian and cause you to be as natural thinking as possible. He tries to get you entangled with just your job, entangled with just your family, atmosphere, and the natural, so much that you never can actually live in the spirit. He wants to wrestle down your thinking. Thinking. Everybody, not everybody, but everybody in this world is trying to hold on to what they have. The Christian life is that I'm willing to let go everything I have for the cause of Christ. What, what is it that you can't give up? If there's something you cannot give up, and when I say give up, cast it on God and let God have it, you leave it alone, don't worry about it because you can't do anything about it. If you're not willing to cast that care upon God and walk on with Jesus, the devil will tie you up and put you in a knot. He will enslave you. I learned over my life to give up all things. And when I say some things, people say, well, that's kind of tough. We would say something like that. I'm trying to tell you, you got to give up everything. Anything you don't give to God and do not take it as yours to fend yourself, to defend yourself, to fight for yourself. If you don't do it, the devil will tie you down in debt to the day you die. And when you get to heaven, you say, well, God will say, well, you was like, uh, you know, when Martha, the story of Martha and Mary, you were encumbered about many things. You were concerned about the things, but he said, 
but she has chosen the best part, the word. How much does the word really mean to you? I say this, and I say this many times, many Christians, when they die and go to heaven, or when Jesus come and get them, they're just going to shake their head. Because they will not be able to go back and do anything over. And one of the things they're really going to be bothered with is that they took more interest in the things of this world than they did the things of God. And it was not where they didn't want to take on the things of God. People just don't preach it to them. Preachers keep people's mind in daily natural activity. It's like we do the teaching on family. How many family oriented? You know what the Bible said about family? Except you're willing to forsake mother or father, sister or brother. Come on, that's what Jesus said. Jesus didn't want you so tired of family you couldn't do the will of God. I'm just telling you. A man died one time. His daddy died. He wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Now, he didn't say the boy couldn't go, but what he's telling him is, look, these things will tie you down. If you with me, you can't always go bury your daddy, your loved ones. You can't be running back and forth. <laughs> Isn't that something? And you can just read over and over again how Jesus did with disciples. When you come in Jesus' classroom, there's a lot expected. Jesus asked a lot of you. It's amazing, ain't it? Rich during the ruler came to Jesus. He said, I done kept all the commandments from my youth. Jesus didn't even question them about it. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Go sell what you have, rich man, and give it to the poor. Then come, follow me. <laughs> he said, I can't do it. How many of you following Jesus? It just ain't a word. It costs you to follow him. If you're going to be a partaker of Christ, and you're going to partake of his calling, that means that you are going to be used by God in that calling. You know, I'm an apostle, right? You are a member of the body of Christ, and you got a gift, and you whatever your call may be. But do you know that I am to have the mind, listen to me, this is my mind as an apostle. I'm first a son. And so I'm a son as an apostle. If I become just an apostle and don't look at myself as a son, then I will not be instructed of a father. I'll just be doing work on the anointed. See, it's the way you think. Whatever your call is, what I call your lower calls, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those are lower calls. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the apostle, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher is here until the, the church matures, come into the unity of the faith, to the measure of the stature of Christ, into the full knowledge of God, into a perfect man. When the church comes to full maturity, you still going to be a son doing the work of the father. But you may not be no prophet no more for the church. You won't be an apostle no more for the church. You won't be an evangelist no more to tell anybody else to get saved. Why? Because all people that's going to get saved are already saved. But you're still going to be a son, as Jesus was. He said, I must be about my father's business. Everything he did, he said, Father, Father. He never said God. And I tell people here at Alpha, I tell you that are watching by live stream, have a son father mentality I'm a son of God with the apostolic gift 
I am an apostolic gift as a son. That means something. My sonship go further than my apostleship. I'm not talking to you. I'm just not hired. I am in the family. I am not in the family business. I'm a part of the family business. See what I'm saying? This is a family corporation. <laughs> it's a family body. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so yes. So we are partakers of Christ, the Son of God, who is king and priest. And out of that comes a lower ministry call. Yes. This is why that as an apostle, just give you a little knowledge, as an apostle, God would give me regions for the apostolic. He'll give me a foundational base of church, churches to establish. As an apostle, because I'm a son, I know the apostle ministry is limited, but the son's ministry is unlimited. Listen, you know what Jesus said about being a son? He said, I do what I see my father do. I say what my father say. He said, he raised the dead, I raised the dead. You hear that? Now, an apostle may raise the dead, an apostolic, but the son can raise the dead outside of the apostolic. This is why when people are trying to hold on to titles, they got the greatest title they miss is sonship. Now, if God makes me an apostle, which he has. And let's say God said, I give you Goldsboro, I give you Kenya, I give you this church in India, I give you this church here, that territory is yours. He'll say, don't go to Chicago, don't go to New York City. See, the apostle can only go where his region is. Regional authority as apostle. Now listen, now, let's suppose God told me that I can't be the apostle in New York, but all of a sudden I got to go to New York. How do I go to New York? As a son. While I'm in New York City, I may go to a church. Mm -hmm. While I'm in New York City, somebody may invite me to the church, but that's why I say I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for my Father in heaven. Now, what that does is this, because I'm there. The son may minister under the anointing, which is beyond the region his apostleship goes. Because God may say, you can go there. So if a demon try to get you and you go to, uh, let's say, Nigeria, and you ain't even an apostle. You ain't a post prophet. You're not an evangelist. You don't have no anointing fivefold ministry. You don't have the ministry of, let's say, uh, miracles given as a gift. But your son, you go to Nigeria, and a demon runs up to you, and you face a demon, you still have authority over that demon because why? The sonship has power anywhere he go. If the devil come at you, you can say, in the name of Jesus. You have high authority. You have high authority. In other words, you're not limited by your gift only. I'm not looking for demons, not looking to go out and do set up a church somewhere, but because I'm there and the earth is my father's, it is the Lord's and all that dwells in, I have the right to stand in his name when I go somewhere if I face any obstacles which that's how I, like I was in a church the other day uh, for the home going. When I sit in that church, the Lord will begin to show you things. But it's not for me to do anything. But sometimes the Lord will teach you things while you're sitting there. 
He'll show you things while you in there. It ain't for you to bother anybody. But I learned a lot. Every time I go somewhere to another church, and I'm just there to visit, I learn the Lord teaches me. Did you hear what I'm saying? So Christ. So we want to be partakers of who? Christ. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the second one, and we're just going to spend a little time in that, and then we'll finish this one up next week. Go to Romans, the eighth chapter. The Romans, the eighth chapter. And the Bible speaks of this over and over again. The 16th verse, it says, The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are what? Didn't say apostles, evangelists, children. Yeah, you're partake of Christ because you're a child. You're partake of Christ because you are his son. Now you're going to partake of something else. 17 verse says, and if children, then what? Heirs of who? God. And what? Joint heirs with what? Christ. Stop right there. Yes. So you have heirship, that means you have become an inheritor. You have a possession in Christ because you are what? A son or a child of God. So it tells you to partake. You say, well, where does it say partake? The Bible says we're joint heirs. That means we have something we share together. Amen. And matter of fact, our fellowship, if the saints really learn how to fellowship 100%, our fellowship is around these things I'm telling you that we partake of. Them. Our commonality, our fellowship, even with God, when people go pray, these are the things you should be talking to him about. I know people say, well, I want to talk about my light bill. I want to talk <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Jesus said, if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, the Gentiles seek these things. He said, all of, it's just going to be added. All the necessities for this life, you don't have to ever ask God for any of them. You got a business? You don't ever have to even talk to God about your business. All you got to do is what? Seek the kingdom and his righteousness. God will prosper it. He does not want you even thinking, worrying about it, or concerned about it. Because what? God cares too much for you while you're in this world going through tribulation that he won't look over and make sure you're provided for. So when you pray, help you enhance your prayer life. Talk about your kingship. How do I administer it here? Talk about your color. I am in the member of Christ. You gave me this gift. How do I operate between the sonship and the gift I have? God, can I go beyond it? See, that's the conversation he wants you to have. That's what the Holy Ghost has come to teach you those things. And the most Christians know nothing about those things. Don't never talk about them with God. It's always about my son, my daughter trying to go to college. It's, all, it's, it's earthly stuff. Seek those things that are above where Christ set. Set your affections on things above. That's what Colossians says, ain't it? It's difficult because why? We've been trained all our life to think here. Bread, food, water, clothes, car. God just bless you, go get a car. God just go bless you, go get a house. Use wisdom to know your natural Extent, and then have the wisdom of God to know how to apply both the spiritual and the natural together. If you're going to go beyond the natural, you've got to have spiritual knowledge. We don't, we don't do what the, the world does. The world said they're going to stretch you. Think high. No, we think by faith. Am I talking to you? Because the world, a lot of times, they, what I call, do trial and error. We don't have the error. If we hear the voice of God, if God lead us, he'll never lead us astray or lead us wrong. 
We are heirs of God. Heirs of God and what? And joint heirs with Christ. Is God the Lord of heaven and earth? Then you participate in that. You, you, are, you say, what's my part? There's nothing pride about that. Asking Jesus, what is my part? How do I participate? How do I work with you? How do I do it? What do you need me to do with you? What do you need me to do on the planet that heaven has purposed it? If people ask him that, they'll get more answers, but people don't ask those things. People still asking God, well, about the natural thing. Ask him. He'll put it in you. It's already there. It's already there. The Holy Spirit want to teach so much. He really does want to be your teacher. Then the Bible says when he comes, he will teach you not one thing, all. And whatsoever I have commanded. That means whatever he's ever said to the body that you need to know that you want there. He's to teach you that. The Bible says, not only that, but he will show you things to come. Have you ever got on your knees, you college students, and you're trying to get through a door? God will show you whether that's the door you're supposed to go through. The thing is, we have to trust and believe him. Prayer is so exciting when you go to God Telling him, I'm coming to you because you the one gave me this. I didn't get this to myself. Now, how do I use it? So that it can please you. You the one that's called me in this earth to represent Jesus. Do I go to this school? Do I go through this job? Until you tell me I'm going through it, but I don't want to go through them. That's not what you want. There's something God will let you go through in life. And it's just to build you to get you where he really wants you. But it's not the, the, the end of it. There's a lot of things God will let us do. And he don't have to every day say, get up, walk five steps, and then turn and walk ten steps, and then uh, jump up and down three times. He don't have to tell you everything to do today. But he wants you to give him your day. He wants you to sacrifice yourself today. He wants you to say, thy will be done, not mine, so that as you're going through the day, he can stop you at any time. You do that, you start hearing from him a lot. Because you can say this to God. If it does not work out, you can say, I asked you. I asked you. So that means this might have not been of course, that you wanted to say anything. Perhaps you allowed me to go this way so I could learn something, so that I can make decisions, so I could call on you. But you evidently didn't stop me. I remember I had a dream one time about my finances, about getting married, and about uh, ministry. All of it came at, at, at the same time. Most of the time, when God is in your life, most of the stuff, you, you don't ask him. He just come to you and share stuff because you don't know what to ask him. So at that time in my life, I had financial problems. I was in debt. At that time in my life, I was wondering whether I should get married because ministry was on me so strong, I didn't want to marry the wrong person. I ain't got time for that trouble and drama. Amen. And I also was questioning about ministry. What is it I'm really supposed to be doing? So one night I fell asleep. And what the Lord showed me was this. It's amazing how he'll minister to you. God don't like uh, doubt and unbelief. It'll, it'll put you out for everything. So here I am. He puts me on this road. The three houses I got to go by. At this time, I'm probably about 20, 
27 years old. It, each one of the houses is a dog. Dogs represent unbelievers. And you know, when you gotta pass a house and a dog is not on a leash, and it's a vicious looking dog, you have some reservation. Because even as a child, I would say, should I go by the house? I ride a bicycle, go real fast. So I know the dog is there, but to get to my destination, I got to go by the house. So I goes on, I'm going by the house, I pass the first one. Of course, the dog comes out, but he does not come and get me. God showed me, he said, that's your finances. You cannot be doubtful. He had told me he was going to bring me out. I'd never get back in again. I had more money than I could count. That's what God told me. You're going on in your journey of life. Don't worry about your finances. What should you be doing? You should just be concerned with pleasing me. I'm going forward. Don't go backwards. Don't stop. If you stop, you're sitting right there with the dog. <laughs> Some people, they start out doing something, they believe in God, and they stop. You are open to the enemy. God is always talking about moving. You got to be moving. You got to be moving. Except when I tell you to stand still, move. Run. Go by the second house, same way. Third house, same way. Second house was dealing with my marriage. God will take care of that. Why are you worried about marriage? Why are you worried about marrying the wrong person? Why are you worried about it? Worried about it because I had so many bad relationships. Why are you worried about it? I sent you the right person. Then I told you, you show me my wife, right? Not in the dream later on. Why? Pleasing God, just walking with God, running with God. Third one, deal with ministry. How am I getting ministry? <laughs> I was at the church doing this time. That's why I tell the young ministers, don't worry about your pastor. You say, pastor don't see me. The pastor, he don't know God got to call him. When the pastor going to send me? You ain't got to worry about it. When your time come, God will get you out of there. He'll put you in ministry, whether the pastor see you or not. Pastor don't even have to be the one to send you. I never worried about it. You know why? If I belong to God, God's more accountable to me than my pastor. Now, am I talking to you? Because who am I serving? I'm serving God under him, but I'm not serving him without God. So if he missed something, God will make up for it. That's what I was learning. The Holy Ghost was teaching me. That's the principles I use today. Same thing I'm working in today. Finally, after I got through the third house, all of a sudden I saw a dark path. It was so dark, and it was like someone saying, go down there. Because why? I went past the dogs. You ain't supposed to be scared. Don't try to tempt God. That's why people make a mistake. They say, God said. You ain't heard him say, you better stay off that road. You got to hear God say, go down that road, because that road would devour you. And so when I saw it, there was a wolf down there. And in my spirit, so I said, no, don't take that road. Keep going straight. Keep going straight. I went straight. Guess what happened? All the three dogs turned into one big dog. And the dog came behind me. When the dog came behind me, I began to lift off the ground like this. By the time I got up this to the back to that ceiling, the dog was as big as the ceiling. He got on his hind legs. And he, my hand was like down like this. He got hold of my hand. And when he got hold of my hand, what he supposed to do? Paul's supposed to hold him in hand, don't he? He didn't have teeth. God teaching me. God teaching me. Tell you what he taught me. As God elevates you, the devil can handle you. You know what the devil does? As a roaring lion, he ain't got no bite to him. The devil comes to make you afraid. But don't be afraid of him. Why? He does not have anything else of power other than fear itself. Started elevating, elevating. All I could feel was pressure. God said, you'll feel pressure from the enemy, but he will not harm you. I got so high up in the sky. Guess what happened? Big door opened. 
gold door. Boom! So that's where your opportunities is. Went through the door, and guess what happened when I went through the door? The dog was gone. You know what God told me? Your enemies that fight you while you're here, God will destroy them. They cannot follow you here. New enemies will come. That's why the three dogs turned to a big dog. Big dog grabbed my hand. When the door opened, he couldn't even follow me behind the door. You know why? The devil is limited, the enemy, and how far he can go with you and how much he can do with you. Am I talking now? Now, I'm saying that to say this. The Holy Spirit. Let him teach you. Talk to God. Talk to God. He will answer your prayer. Yeah. Today, I'm on that road for that destination. Seven doors open. Opportunities that God must open up for me with you. Seven doors. Amen? So I haven't arrived there yet because at the end I was in a big place, great auditorium, lots of people were there, and God said, these people are waiting on you. So in other words, your destiny that God has for you, it's waiting for you to get there. So what? You got to keep going. You got to keep letting God raise you up. You get there. But it will not be with that pressure. It will not be with that faith. Amen. So next week we'll deal with inheritance a little bit more. I will come out of Colossians 1.12 where it says with the partake of our inheritance and the light. Light where the fellowship is, where God is. You cannot partake or share with Christ, participate with Christ in the dark. All your participation, all your sharing, all your fellowship, all of what you do with Christ is done in the light because he's the light. Now, we may go in the dark, but we don't live in the dark. We live in the light. If you want to be held up in God's kingdom, walk around in the dark with no light, you'd be as a blind man. The dark won't make for us. The light will. Amen? The Christians can see more, uh, the, the sinner can see more in the dark than the Christian. Unless the Christian is in the light, then the Christian can see what the sinner can't see. But if you go in the dark, the sinner, because he's used to the dark, he'll know more about the dark than you will. But when you're in the light, there's things about the dark he do not know that is revealed. Secret things that he cannot know that we can know while in the dark. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I enjoyed y'all tonight. Enjoy you tonight. Let's get rid of I tell you, I got an awesome word for you on the conference night. And I thank God for you that will be showing up. I expect to see everyone here. Um, want to make the announcement again that Janie McFadden, as well as um, Donald Stevens, will be getting married right after the service Sunday. It'll just be a short ceremony. Uh, they are going to be married. And so we say to people that if, you know, bring a gift for them, kind of bring them something the Lord put on your heart, they will have a gift box, box out there uh, for people that want to give into their marriage life. Um, Sometimes people don't have anything right then. They are going to be at 424 Odom Street. It's out there on the bulletin board. If you're not able to make it to the marriage, they'll be home. Uh, all that afternoon, they'll be taking guests to come through and say hello or to congratulate them. That's 424 Odom Street right here in Goldsboro. And so you're welcome to come by there. If you don't have a gift Sunday, you can bring it the next Sunday when you see them. But uh, it's always good to just bless people. Amen. And, and so we thank God for them being children of God. I think there was something else I was going to announce. I don't. I think that's it. Nothing else to say. We'll be dismissed by saying Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow for Morning Rhema at 11 o'clock. Have a good evening.